Let's bring in our great friend, North Dakota Senator Kevin Kramer, for a lot more on all of this. Senator Kramer, thank you, sir. You've been in the Ukraine, so you're uh, more than just an observer. You're actually in the middle of this thing. I, I just want to ask you right at the top, what is your opinion about putting in uh, whatever, 8,000, 8,500 additional American troops uh, into the NATO theater? What do you think about that? Well, Larry, I think you hit the nail on the head in your monologue. What we should have done has been tougher up front. Um, with regard to, for example, Nord Stream 2, when, when um, Joe Biden, he really, that was really an act of appeasement. When he let that pipeline be finished off on behalf of Angela Mer Merkel in Germany and, of course, as a result, uh, Vladimir Putin, he, would, he handed Vladimir Putin a weapon. In, in this in, entire uh, confrontation. And so had he, had he been tougher up front, had he recognized the uh, Vladimir Putin's ability to use energy a, as a force, as a lever, really a weapon in uh, not just with Ukraine, but with all of uh, Europe, um, we may not be here today. Uh, that said, then he comes, you know, then we come up to last week when, you know, six of my colleagues and I, a bipartisan delegation, went to Ukraine uh, to exercise and demonstrate our solidarity as a country, our solidarity as, as a Senate, Republicans and Democrats standing with our president and our State Department uh, saying, we stand with Ukraine, we will stand against Russian aggression. And uh, the, the next morning, we have a nice meeting with the president, and we spend an hour talking about all these things. And later that day, he says, well, if it's a minor incursion, mm. well, maybe we have to talk about it. I mean, that's like inviting a jewelry thief to the Tiffany's Christmas party and telling mm. him not to touch the merchandise. I mean, it's just absurd. And so th this weakness that is presented by his actions doesn't match the tough talk. Now he doubles down um, by, by, you know, sending troops. And, and, to be fair, it's, it's you know all of NATO seems to be somewhat engaged in this, or willing to move troops around in some sort of an exercise. The problem is that if that is to be a deterrent, which is what their hope is, when it's not, when you've seen these these weak moves by our president up to this point, it's hard to take him very seriously. So uh, I, I worry that the mixed signals are creating more chaos, frankly, than um, than a deterrent. Regarding NATO, Senator Kramer. Germany is of no help. In fact, Germany has been a hindrance. In fact, Germany looks to be rather more on Putin's side. They've stopped uh, arms movements into the Ukraine, and they've issued uh, statements that are ambiguous at best, and I, I guess, guess they just had to fire one of their Navy guys. I'm just saying, NATO, well, the biggest chunk of NATO is Germany. France and Germany apparently mm -hmm. negotiating with Russia on their own. The United States is not on that phone call. So far as I know, I wish I were wrong, but that's what I understand. And um, as Donald Trump uh, said time and time again, uh, you know, they're not really paying their fair share of the financial burdens either. So, like, what's NATO? Why do I want to put it? Anybody put 8,000 troops into NATO? I don't get that. Well, for good question. I mean, it, they, I think it's 8,500 of our troops, and you know, along with other NATO troops, um, moving throughout Eastern Europe to send a message of, of solidarity. But you're right. Germany has been a particular problem, both in their, uh, first of all, their acquiescence to uh, being captive by Russian natural gas through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, it really endangering many of their own uh, allies and neighbors in their neighborhood. Um, but remembering, too, though, that the stability of Europe is what's at stake. It's not simply, um, you know, Ukraine, another you know, former Soviet state becoming, again, a for, uh, uh, Soviet state. Uh, the ramifications are t to a, a stable or an unstable Europe. And so we need to have a strong NATO. We need to have a strong Europe. The problem is that within the European Union themselves, they are a little bit confused. I mean, you talk about France and Germany negotiating with Vladimir Putin. I just read a story, an energy story, where France is trying to convince Germany that their nuclear should be considered clean energy in the European Union, and and uh, uh, Germany's response is, well, our gas should be, and neither one thinks the other one's uh, fuel source is good enough to be considered clean energy. I mean, th th this is, you know, this is uh, sort of backyard 
nonsense. We need to have a serious discussion about stabilizing Europe because remember, it doesn't just end in Europe. Right? You already talked about Afghanistan and what that the kind of signal that sent to Vladimir Putin. Well, what we do here is going to send a signal to China and Taiwan. It's going to send signals to Iran. Uh, you already talked about the uh, acquiescence to Iran, not to acquiescence. I mean, helping them pay their United Nations dues right. so they can vote against us. Can we, I mean, it's complete absurdity. Can we pause on that? I don't ever mean to interrupt, sir, but I'm just saying. No, no. I course. just got wind of this. It was actually, an, I saw it this morning, a New York Sun editorial uh, I was put together by Seth Lipsky and my friend Claudia mm -hmm. Rosette, old Wall Street Journal editorial writer and a great lady. Um, so I wasn't aware of this. So let me get this right. We're going to pay Iranian dues so they can vote on a new John Kerry, God knows who, deal with Iran, right, which has broken everything and building their 60 percent home on nuclear weapons, and we don't have to go to the U.S. Congress. Now, can't anybody, I mean, can't Senator Kevin Kramer just stand there on the well of the Senate floor and just yell about this and say, stop, stop, stop? Well, you know, if I was at the Senate floor, I'd probably be, I probably would have gone to the Senate floor and said, stop, 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 along with a whole bunch of my colleagues, but we're not there this week. Um, no, the way the way this works is there was, what, $18 million that was frozen in an account in right. South Korea. The United Na or the United States, um, you know, unfroze it, thawed it out, and told their, our friends in South Korea, go ahead, go ahead and give it to them. I mean, really, if you and I were to write a spy novel, you know, it, we, we couldn't come up with a scenario like this one. Yeah, boy, it's just so disappointing. Now, let me ask you this. The report from British intelligence, and again, you were in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to get the Ukrainians. Just last week, yeah. What'd they say to you? Like, the Brits... The British Foreign Office or somebody, I don't know, GHHQ, somebody saying that mm -hmm. Russia plans to uh, invade. Um, they've got surrounded now. There's uh, on, the, uh, on the eastern side, of course. Now they've got their troops in Belarus up north. They already own Crimea. They're putting ships into the Black Sea. So they, got, right. they could go into uh, Kiev. It, it could be an unofficial. It doesn't yeah. have to be an official assembly or whatever Biden characterized it the other day in his press conference. Is there going to be a coup d'etat? Do the Ukrainians think there's going to be a coup d'etat? Well, you know, th interestingly, the, the Ukrainians themselves, uh, and the, including the Ukrainian um, leadership, are not as convinced of, of an invasion. At least they weren't last week. They may be more convinced today than they were last week. Of course, they're hopeful because remember, too, that they've been living with this sort of tension for the last at least eight years where, um, you know, Russian troops come close to the border and then they may back off a little bit. The obviously occupation of Crimea, uh, Georgia, uh, Belarus, the, you know, they're, they're just, they've always sort of been hanging around in a, a bit of a nuisance. So you tend to get a little too comfortable, perhaps. And that was my sense from, mm. uh, from the Ukrainian leadership. Um, all of that said, this latest revelation from British intelligence intelligence suggests to me that that may be the minor uh, incursion that uh, that mm. President Biden had in mind. But I can tell you, uh, Larry, a pro-Russian leader embedded into Ukrainian leadership, perhaps even, um, you know, as the president, uh, also recalling, they don't have a single member of, of parliament in Ukraine, this pro-Russian mm. um, this pro-Russian party. But to put somebody like that in leadership in Ukraine would be about as destabilizing to Europe as, the, as an invasion itself. I mean, I don't really see, it would be like a, a difference without a distinction, in my mind, in, in many respects. So Ukraine is, is tough enough. Uh, while they're freedom-loving, uh, you know, democratic people uh, and sovereign, a sovereign nation, um, you know, they still look more like Russia than they look like the United States in many respects. And, and I think uh, President Zelensky's done a good job of, of rooting out, you know, little by little some of the, some of the corruption in the country. Um, you know, he ran on a, you might recall, he ran on a uh, an anti-corruption platform, mm -hmm. was hugely successful as an outsider, much like a, a president that we we know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think you also find when you get into office, it's not as easy as you might have thought. And But I think he's making progress uh, little by little, and we ought to be standing up for him and for that sovereignty as long as he's still the duly elected president of Ukraine and not green lighting in any way, shape, or form, the embedding of, of a Russian, pro-Russia leader into into Ukraine's parliament, or God forsake, or God help us uh, into the presidency. You know, I sat in on two uh, bilateral lunches with President Trump and President Zelensky, and uh, as did others of our national security team. 
I thought he was a very smart guy. I do not think people routinely call him corrupt. He's not corrupt. There's no evidence that he's corrupt. There is evidence that he's trying to fight corruption uh, right. and cleaned house on their uh, legal establishment. One last one while I have you here. Um, there are 52 moles in the U.S. Senate that are working to save America and kill the bill. 52 <laughs> moles. Now, they killed, they, killed, they killed the effort to kill the filibuster, so that's awfully good. And um, yes. I know President uh, Biden on Wednesday said you're going to have build back smaller pieces or chunks or whatever. But in chunks, a word, yeah. Senator Craig, we've been counting on you. You're one of our main <laughs> people. Um, are we going to save America and still kill the bill? Well, I've been called worse than a mole, uh, Larry, and I, <laughs> I say that I with love, we with much love. And <laughs> respect. I could tell, I could tell that was an affectionate term from you. Um, but I actually think, uh, interestingly, the idea of breaking it up into chunks is fine as far as I'm concerned. But there's really nothing in the Build Back Broke plan that's all that great. There might be some bits and pieces here on energy policy. I think the best way to, to move forward with some bipartisan suggestions is to wipe the slate clean, get a new white sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Sit down with people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and others who want to be serious about bipartisan solutions and then and then move forward. As you might have noticed, we have this little inflation problem. We have a southern border problem. We actually have an energy security challenge that was fixed a, a few years ago and, and now it's back. I think there are bipartisan solutions, but I think it's time to just knock off the nonsense. We're not going to blow up the United States Senate. Um, you know, we, we've already run up more than more debt than is helpful. Uh, let's sit down now and have some All adult right. uh, conversations. I think there are some things we can do together. Great. That's just that's just the kind of mole that we love. <laughs> Senator Kevin Kramer, you're terrific, <laughs> you're sir. You're the best. Thank you ever so much. Talk <laughs> soon. Thanks.